Hi guys. So this is a very qu quick, short video. So yeah, this is just basically two short little cases and they're from olden times. On the 2nd of March 1888 at Knocknamuckley Church in Armagh, there was a wedding. 25 year old Thomas Thompson was marrying Fanny Moffat. Thomas was a master spinner from Gifford and his wife-to-be was a farmer's daughter from nearby Lisnamintry. So on that morning, just before 10am, Elizabeth McCready arrived to open up the church and then Reverend Oates arrived. Then guests started arriving and one of these guests was William Thompson. Now, you might think that's Thomas's brother because of O. Thompson, but no. It was his brother-in-law. So Thomas Thompson was actually a widower. His wife had died the previous year. So William was his brother-in-law. Would you still be a brother-in-law if she dies? I don't know how that works. Especially if you marry again. I don't think you can have more than one set of in-laws. So he comes in and he sits on the left-hand side. And he sits the fourth pew from the back. And so then the wedding party arrived. So as Thomas Thompson was arriving to, you know, walk up to get to the top of the altar to wait, William Thompson stood up as he passed him and he calmly took a revolver out of his pocket and shot his brother-in-law in the back. Thomas turned and the two men struggled. Eventually some um, groomsmen would then have to tackle William to the ground. Someone had to go by horse to Portadown to get the police and a doctor. Thomas was hit. The bullet basically penetrated through his lung. And he was brought to the sexton's house. And two doctors arrived. And they actually extracted the bullet. However, he was dying. And he said, quote, Oh, Will, I did not think you would do this to me. But I am dying and I forgive you. And Thomas died shortly after that. William was obviously charged with murder. Now... He would say that he shot him because he told him that if he was to remarry, he would shoot him. It had turned out that Thomas Thompson had not treated his wife very well. He was, you know, I think quite cruel to her. I'm not sure. They had a child, but I'm not sure how cruel he was to the child. And when she then became ill and died, Thomas did not attend her funeral. And William says that it was him who had to pay then like that for the medical bills and for the funeral. And so he said the reasons for saying that he would shoot was not necessarily out of like a, let's say, a kind of a spiteful or jealousy thing. It was because he did not want to see him mistreat another woman. And he also had concern for their child. The trial was held on the 10th of July that year. And it would be said that William had bought the revolver the day before in Portadown. The jury basically had to decide if it was murder or manslaughter. But there were so many witnesses. There was no evidence to suggest it was a manslaughter. And so the judge said that they had to find him guilty of murder. And so after only 10 minutes of deliberation, they found him guilty of murder. And this would mean death by hanging. He was calm while he was being sentenced to death. And when asked if he wanted to say anything, he said he knew he had broken the law. And that he deserved to die. However, a few weeks later, this was actually commuted to life. And then I don't really understand what happened. But then a plea of insanity was put through. And then he was committed to the Dundrum Criminal Lunatic Asylum. Which would go on to be the Central Mental Hospital. However, after just a few weeks, William Thompson escaped. And obviously went on to do whatever he wanted to do. Live whatever life he wanted to live. But strangely, on the 10th of September 1906... He went into the police barracks at Market Hill in Armagh and confessed and went back to prison. I don't know what happened after that. Did he spend the rest of his life in prison? I'm not sure. What did he do in those mystery years? We don't know. Heads up this next one is quite heavy. There will be a, a death of a child. Oliver Bodkin was a wealthy landowner from Galway. He lived in Carrollbawn House on the Hedford Road, which was about four kilometres from Tomb in Galway. He got married in 1720 and they went on to have a son, John. Now, <laughs> it should just be John Bodkins. But apparently, because a lot of people, they just keep naming the name. <laughs> I've said this before. They just name people the same names and stuff. So basically, John was known as John Fitz Oliver. So it nearly seems like it's like John, the son of Oliver. So like in Irish, that's what we say, like knee and O. Um, is like son of and daughter of 
So it must be something like that because other names that I'm going to come across will also be like that. It'll be, you know, Mary Fitz, whatever, or John Fitz, whatever. But anyway, we'll come to it. So when little John is 10, his mother dies and his dad would remarry two years later in 1732. And they would go on to have a son the following year called Oliver, which is unusual because normally fathers name their first child after themselves. Now, it's not mentioned that this happens for their first child. Before Oliver, he is basically given to a foster family for the first three years of his life. And apparently this is like a normal custom. I've never heard of it before, but it's very interesting. So basically the child is raised in its, <laughs> in its like formative years, the most important years of a human's life is spent not with a mother and father, like his birth mother and father, they're spent with foster mother and father. And in that tree, he's given back to Oliver Bodkin and his wife. So John is obviously around 13 when the brother is born, Oliver. So John would go on then to study at Trinity College and it would be determined, you know, for him that he would go into law. However, I don't think he really liked this. He kind of fell into... I don't want to say a wrong crowd, but he basically liked messing, partying, drinking, whatever. And so he fell behind in his studies and eventually he left. He returned home to Carabon House, but he was quite jealous of Oliver and he resented his stepmother. And so eventually he left and he actually went to live at Carrow Beg House. And this was only like a mile away. And this was owned by his uncle, John Bodkin. So there's two Johns now. And he was a barrister. So he actually spent a lot of time in Dublin. He wasn't really at the house. And he was known by like the name um, Counselor. The Counselor. That's what people called him. So he had two sons. And they were known as Patrick Fitz Counselor and John Fitz Counselor. Because obviously again like it's like John son of Counselor or whatever. And Patrick the son of. It's so weird because I never knew Fitz was one of those words. I know there's O and knee for Irish. But anyway. Because like Fitz is like. Fitzgibbon, Fitzsimons, Fitzmaurice, Fitzpatrick. I didn't know it was kind of used as a prefix on its own. Oh my gosh, I just realised Fitzmaurice, Fitzpatrick. So because the barrister and his sons were very rarely there, another uncle looked after the property and his name was Dominic. He was unmarried. He was quite, I don't think a lot of people liked him. He was quite, he could be quite... Um, agitating you know violent and stuff and then he was blind in one eye and he had been scarred as a child with smallpox so he was quite like ah, scary and so John lived with his uncle Dominic who went by like blind Dominic he lived with him for four years at Carrowbeg house and like that the barrister and his sons would come here or there and in 1739 the two sons come to spend some time there and one morning Patrick was found dead in his bed and like it was sudden but it didn't seem to look like suspicious or sinister so like no investigation or anything was done and then a couple of years go by so in the spring of 1741 John would find out that his father Oliver Bodkin had changed the will and was leaving everything to Oliver. John was furious and Oliver would actually tell a friend Lord Athenry that John had threatened to kill him. So John hatched a plan and he actually got blind Dominic in on it. Obviously because they lived together and stuff they were probably both giving out about like the successful like Dominic was probably giving out about his successful brother and all this jazz. So I'd say they formed a bond over it. So he agreed to help. So did John Hogan who was the foster father of little Oliver. And this other guy, Roger Kelly, who I don't really know why they got him involved in the first place. So anyway, on the 18th of September, 1741, they all had dinner at Carrowbeck House and made their plan. They agreed that it would be safer to use, like, knives and a uh, sword because obviously there would be no noise made from these, so it would be um, less chance of raising the alarm. So the following night, they decided to do this. And while they were getting ready and stuff... And while they were getting ready in that, Roger Kelly, who I decided, don't know why they got him involved in the first place, said that he was going out to check on his horse. But when he went out, he fled. Now, this didn't seem to cause any alarm for the other guys and they just continued to get ready. And at around midnight, they headed for Carrowbarn House. So, John Hogan was actually a tenant who lived, I think, on the property. So, the guard dogs knew him. And so, this is why... 
he had been asked to take part. Now, I don't know why he would agree to take part, maybe obviously for money, but this is why they wanted him to be a part, because the dogs wouldn't um, bark if he was to come onto the property. So basically, they come onto the property, the dogs approach John Hogan, and they slit the dogs' throats. They then went into the barn, which was like um, the workers' quarters, and there was two men and two boys asleep, and they slit their throats. They then went into the house. There was a merchant staying from Galway called Marcus Lynch, and he was actually just travelling and kind of just stayed on a whim, you know, rather than travelling. And so again, they killed him. They also killed a servant and his wife. Now, interestingly enough, it wasn't John Fitz Oliver who went in to kill his dad. John Hogan did. So he went in and in the bed was Oliver and his wife who was pregnant. So he kills the two of them. And in the action of killing them, Oliver, who also slept in that room and was about eight at this time, woke. And so John Hogan went over to kill him. And Oliver basically cried and said, like, ah, like, and called him dad. And was like, ah, oh, dad, like, please don't kill me, like. And so he told him to stay quiet and lie down. And he, he smeared him with blood. And just then, blind Dominic came in and realised what was happening. Threatened John Hogan that if he did not kill the child, he would kill him. And so I don't know why you would go from one extreme to the other, but he slid. Oliver's throat so viciously that his head came off and then he put the head on the body of Oliver Bodkin in the bed and then they left and the next morning the bodies of all the murdered people were discovered when John Fitz Oliver arrived then he tried to feign surprise and grief some people would notice though that he had like blood and like other stains on his clothing when Lord Athenry arrived, he immediately suspected John. He interrogated him. Obviously, John denied it. But he was like a justice of the peace. So he was um, obviously able to like arrest him. So he got him arrested and brought to Galway Jail. So John Hogan, Blind Dominic and John Fitz Councillor were all arrested. But John Fitz Councillor would be cleared. There was no, nothing to say that he was involved. And on the 6th of October, 1741, they like to keep things quick, there was a trial. John Hogan would plead guilty and say that he wanted to save the child. But I feel like then that kind of is disputed then because you killed him so violently. Blind Dominic and John Bodkins would also plead guilty. And they would all be sentenced to death. So they were all sentenced to be hanged. And it was customary at the time for the bodies then to be hanged close to the crime so blind dominic and john hogan were hanged on a tree outside Carrollbarn house when john bodkin was about to be hanged he then decided to snitch uh no i'm kidding but he decided to basically say that when patrick fitzcounselor was you know discovered dead it was john fitzcounselor who had murdered him and it was this whole thing and john fitzcounselor was there when he was being hanged so he immediately fled but he would be caught later and tried and hanged the bodies of john bodkin and blind dominic were basically just hung up in chains where they had been hanged however john hogan's head was stuck on a spike at the market house and tomb and I feel like that is appropriate. The house then, Carabon, would eventually then later be demolished. So that's it. There's two little mini, I don't know if you heard my leg just click like an old lady. Two olden day cases for you guys. I'm excited trying different things. Let me know what you think of the different things. And I hope you enjoyed this video. And hope you're good. Yeah, please take care. Stay safe. That's the same thing. We shall see you in the next video. Thanks. Bye.